So where does the penis go and how does it all work together? Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Alice. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Wiggle and Grunt Standish. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, you can subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Lovecraft Country, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all that information and past episodes at ShadowTV.com. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ShadowTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games and host watch parties. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing tonight? This is our Thanksgiving turkey tacular this year. I have something very special to be thankful for, and it's our listeners. Uh, my daughter, Emma, she's five, and her school was doing a challenge for the American Heart Association. Uh, it's the Kids Heart Challenge. It's trying to get kids active, to get them out there, uh, you know, staying physically fit, educate them, and also to raise money for kids who can't afford uh, the treatment that they need. So she came home one day, and she said, I really want to do this. And I said, okay, let's set it up. She sets it up. She does this video, and then she says, Daddy... Could you ask your podcast friends if they'd want to help? And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, I got to do it. I put it out there. It was the last day. And our listeners came through more than I could have ever dreamed. $825. Shoo. The teachers who's running it said it's the most the school has ever had. Approximately 30% of the entire school goal. Uh, it just reaffirms that there are good people and for people to step up. And the stories that people shared that who had had conditions and it actually benefited from the american heart association i wanted to say thank you yeah and this is the episode you get for your 860 dollars. well it's adam r and i mean adam r has commissioned i think probably like 15 16 maybe 20 movies he's probably done 30 percent of our our reviews <laughs> uh and this year he wanted us to do the heartwarming 1991 road trip comedy dutch and he wrote in and said, Dear Shat Crew, thank you again for yet another commission. I hope by this point in our relationship, our commissions are coming off as supportive of the awesome work you guys do and not gluttonous. That out of the way, for this round, I chose the severely underrated 1991 road trip masterpiece, Dutch. I don't remember the first time I saw this film, but I do remember thinking it had three things I wasn't accustomed to seeing in films as a kid, but have since grown to appreciate the impact of Thanksgiving, Ed O'Neill, and Divorce. Growing up, Thanksgiving being sandwiched in between two superior holidays in life and film, if not for the food, parade, and naps, I could have cared less about. Now older and with a family of my own, I appreciate the time spent together much more. It's still underrepresented in film, planes, trains, and automobiles aside, so Dutch is a nice caveat. Ed O'Neill is the Chevy Chase you Shaq crew deserved but never got. Great presence, timing, and physical comedy. Dutch was my first real introduction to him, and I've been a fan ever since. Divorce was probably the biggest awakening of this movie for me as a kid. My parents were married 42 years. The idea that people just didn't stay together forever was anathema to me. On screen, leaving your partner seemed to get likewise oscillating treatment on my viewing spectrum, either as a backdrop for comedic ploys like a major league or as a setup for some really, really bad shit, sleeping with the enemy or radio flyer. Now grown, I think this film did a good job with a tough subject. So have at it. Sure, Judge is a hodgepodge, but in a Kerouac meets Married with Children, but produced by John Hughes kind of way. Sometimes ill-timed, sometimes crass, but also sometimes magic. For me, it's mostly the latter. Have fun and happy Thanksgiving, Adam. See, it's funny, Adam, that Thanksgiving for you was like the minor holiday because in my family, it was the opposite. Like having a family that was 
from several different countries and also from several different religions. That's the one that everybody agreed on. It was like Thanksgiving. Everybody was down for Thanksgiving. So everybody would fly back to Arizona no matter where in the country they were. And only recently did I become a big Christmas fan. Now I'm fucking Christmas crazy. But for the longest time, it was Thanksgiving for me because it was like food. You get to see everybody. There's football. Mm -hmm. And in Arizona, you get to play outside. So that was like the perfect holiday. Uh, I agree. I am 100% Thanksgiving. It's the one time a year my whole family gets back together in New York. It's the cold weather. It feels like the holidays. It's not like Florida. Uh, You get to relax. So it is the one holiday I I look forward to the most. And and, uh, this movie kind of jump started that week for me. So, Big D, trivia for you. Do you think Ash is more Halloween or Christmas? Oh, my God. I thought She's like Martha Stewart. I think she's any holiday, but I think Christmas, obviously. She grew up religious. She's got kids. I picture the tree, the light. I, I think it is just uh, all over the place for Christmas. So, I have eight Rubbermaid containers of stuff for Christmas. <laughs> of course you do. Fourteen for Halloween. Oh, surprise. Hey, take the girl out of New Orleans. Keep the Halloween in her. Dutch is a 1991 road comedy directed by Peter Feynman in his second and last theatrical film after Crocodile Dundee, nod to Australian cinema, written by John Hughes. The original music score was composed by Alan Silvestri, and the film stars Ed O'Neill in the title role, Ethan Embry, and Joe Beth Williams, with a cameo appearance by golfer great Arnold Palmer. O'Neill and Embry would star together again over a decade later in the 2003 version of the series Dragnet. Christopher McDonald, Ari Myers, and E.G. Daly co-star in the film. Ash, Big D, we always ask where you were the first time you saw the movie or your memories of it. Big D, we'll start with you. What are your memories of Dutch? So I think I may have lied on a previous podcast. I thought I'd seen this. I could have sworn I'd seen it, but I think I just got it mixed up with some of the road trip movies because I was living in Sweden when this came out. So it, this was not in the theaters there. I may have seen pieces, but this time for this review for Adam was the first time I've watched it all the way through. Yeah, I can't really remember the first time that I saw this. I really just more than anything remember that my family hated it because my family thought that Ed O'Neill was like really dark and cynical and like a way that Clark Griswold was not. So they just like rejected it. Um, I think the other problem here is that my dad especially really despised Married with Children. He hated that show. And so I don't think any of that helped either. But I was really happy to come back and revisit this in adulthood. And especially in light of, you know, Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving is my least favorite holiday. I am not a fan of Thanksgiving at all. It's a holiday that surrounds a bunch of like brown colored food. Um, And I am not a fan of turkey. So like a holiday that surrounds the one meat that I despise. It's not a big, <laughs> it's not a big deal to me. So I, I don't know. I, I was excited for maybe a Thanksgiving movie to give me some feelies so that I actually, you know, got excited for the holiday this year. So yeah, she got to come to Persian Thanksgiving because we got lamb, ham, potatoes, tomatoes. I mean, we got oh my fucking God, that everything. Song. There's kebabs. There's dolma. Like you can you can just go bananas in there. You don't have to eat turkey. I'm not a big. I think turkey is a garbage meat. I'll eat it on Thanksgiving, but I got to put like stuffing and gravy on top of it to make it palatable. Mm-hmm. I remember everything about Dutch. This is a pillar uh, in my cinematic upbringing. My cousin Pej, he's 12 years older than I am, and he. Uh, escaped Iran and went to Pakistan and then from Pakistan went to Spain. And then he finally came to the U S when I was five. So in 1985, dark skinned, like skinny dude with a mustache and big eyeballs. And he shows up and I'm like, fuck, this guy's like street smart. He's been to all these different countries and shit. And he's like tough, right? No bullshit guy, man, a few words. And I'd never experienced any human being like this. So Dutch comes out we see it together and I totally saw us as the main characters. Like I was Doyle and he was Dutch. I'm this, I'm this soft pampered kid and he's this tough guy. And it quickly became one of our favorite movies. Uh, You know, we'd reenact all the scenes, like the looking pathetic thing. We thought that was really hilarious to do with each other. I hadn't seen it in so long that I was really worried it wouldn't hold up. Like I'd build it up to be much more than it was in my head. Like Memphis Bell, which at one point was my favorite movie of all time. And now I'm like, why is Harry Connick Jr. singing in the tail gunner position? So I'm trying my best tonight to be objective. I don't know. I'm still really distracted by this whole Persian Thanksgiving and really offended that yeah. I haven't been invited yet. So just saying. I'll, I'll send you photos. You'll love it. Oh, you're invited. 
Yeah, photo photos sound like a real invite to me. Yeah, sounds like a real invite to me there, Jane. I will fly you out. I will fly <laughs> you out. If you're willing to miss Thanksgiving with your own family, I will fly you out. I'm there, friend. <laughs> All right. Well, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Let's roll the trailer. So awesome, Good cry. <laughs> Let me go down and get him. I'm a communicator. I'm a breakthrough kind of guy. Your mom's on the phone. I don't have a mom. You may have a mom. I have a mother. They've only just met. I'm a friend of your mother's. I came to get you to bring you home. And already, they get along. Like family. I'm not going anywhere with you. What do you like to do for fun? Oh, you like the wiggle and grunt. Me too. So you and Doyle are getting along well. Ah, he's not a bad kid. We're getting along just great. Come on, give it to me, pipsqueak. Ah, we're taking our time. We're seeing the country. And as Doyle himself said, nothing beats traveling the highways and byways. Okay, sugar, what'll it be? What won't make me vomit? <laughs> give me the cheese. <laughs> This isn't working out. We're not masters of the highway. We were robbed by homebound hookers. Only because you fell asleep and I got excited. You did? I know where Dutch and Doyle are staying tonight. Knowing Doyle, it'll be first class. 20th Century Fox presents the story of a boy. I got a deck of racy playing cards. Who lost the child in himself. And the man... Who helped him find it. Is that your most pathetic look? That's not going to get us a ride. This is pathetic. <laughs> Try it. See, I'm not such a bad guy, huh? Dutch. You're like a great big demented child. <laughs> Dutch Dooley attends a ritzy party with his girlfriend, Natalie Standish. There, he meets Natalie's snobbish, wealthy ex-husband, Reed, who tells Natalie that he will have to break his Thanksgiving plans with their son, Doyle, for an unexpected business trip to London. Natalie invites Doyle home for Thanksgiving, but Doyle refuses the offer, solely blaming his mother for the divorce. So, Dutch offers to go to Georgia and bring Doyle back to Chicago for the holidays. So, as this movie opens up, we get the typical, predictable scene we got all the rich people, and they've got all the things that rich people eat, like caviar, and it's super stuffy, and nobody's having a good time at the party. And who walks on screen but Christopher McDonald? Fucking Shooter McGavin from Happy Gilmore. And I see him, and I'm like, okay, I'm excited already. I didn't remember him being in this. I thought hilarity would ensue, but we got like just a just the tiniest bite of Christopher McDonald. It was a dry turkey nibble of Christopher McDonald. And I really wish we could have had more scenes with him or at least a little more time with him doing what he does. Cause he looks hilarious. He's got the hair. He's got this, this mustache that trademark Christopher McDonald sneer. And I was waiting for him to get a little more threatening like shooter McGavin. I was ready for him to get a little more flamboyant, and have more idiosyncrasies. And I just wanted some real reasons to hate him. And then before I knew it, he was just off the screen. That was it. I kind of love that with Christopher McDonald, every villain type character he plays, there's always something like insanely outlandish about him. And here, I mean, it's absolutely the hair. But more than that, he's got that affect that's like this accent that isn't really an accent. It's just this thing that rich people do where they enunciate the wrong parts of words, but they do it in such a snooty way. It sounds like, is that actually right? Have I been saying that word wrong? Because I think rich people like this character they want to sound so worldly but really like really wealthy conservatives like this because i'm just assuming he's conservative they stay around their country club they stay in their country they don't actually travel other than to places that other americans are and i think that's what's so fantastic about it and christopher mcdonald does this he chews up the scenes every detail of every single movie that he's in see i think he's just swarmy enough like he he walks by and he runs his finger down that girl's back any more gene and it would just be overkill i was expecting it to be like this over the top crazy goofball you know road trip but it's not it's kind of grounded so you needed him to be believably hateable but this movie hinges on the two main characters 
Ed O'Neill being the main. He was born to play Dutch Dooley. I always remembered Al Bundy, but Al Bundy's obnoxious. He's like the goofball dad Dutch. He's a decent dude. He's well-meaning. He's trying to do right by the woman he loves. But thankfully, thankfully, he is not like a lot of the stepdads. He's not perfect. You know, I think of like Liar Liar, where the stepdad's like, hey, come here, let's play. He's a regular dude. We get the reveal when he's making the big meal, and you're thinking it's going to be this great meal, and then, oh, it cuts. They're in a restaurant. He can't cook. The one thing about him, though, is he's pushing himself. He's trying to portray himself as a working schmo, as a regular guy. But I think he's much more than that. He is blue-collar rich. There's a scene they're driving, and you see the Dutch construction sign, and this is nowhere near where he lives. But even though he's got money, he remains grounded, or like Adam said, he doesn't do the right thing. He doesn't you know, say the right thing at the right moment. He doesn't do the things you would expect him to do. It's very relatable. He's very real. It's tough to deal with kids, and especially when they're not yours. I was really worried in the opening scene where you see him get locked out of this party. He's smoking a cigar out there. And then, of course, like a little dog comes and attacks him. And he's like flicking caviar off of a cracker. And I thought, oh, God, we're going to get one of these like King Ralph Clark Griswold buffoon type characters. But no, like the other thing about Dutch is he's a real ass kicker and he fucking loves he fucking loves his woman. Yep. It's sad when you see how rarely a character <laughs> like this exists outside of like action movies, right? I mean, he tells Reed, I'll hit you so hard your dog will bleed. And I'm like, cool. Like, all right, I like this yeah, guy. I'm on board. Right. Yeah. And I have to say that I know that the commissioner, Adam, he, he already mentioned it, but I learned about divorce like he did in movies like this one. Because like Adam, divorce was a totally foreign concept to me. My parents, I would come to to find out many years later, we're not actually happy, but they were together. And it absolutely terrified me to the core, this idea that I would be split between two households. And now that I have kids myself, I have to say I relate a ton to the mom in this, to Dutch's girlfriend, because kids, they fucking blame you for everything. We have had one bad fight in front of our children. One. And I don't believe in that. We try to avoid it at all times, but it just happened. And my husband's a yeller while I am not. And so he yelled. And for weeks, it was like, mommy, why did you make dad so angry? And it's like, what? Like, what the yeah. fuck? Right? And that's what they do. They blame you for everything. And so I can't imagine bearing the weight of a divorce when kids just don't know how to process things. But she's also letting some guy meet your kid, bring him back alone. That seems like a big stretch, like that most like sane parents wouldn't allow. And I know that like the 80s and early 90s were not as much of a paranoid time, but I call bad mom here. Am I am I alone? I would never let somebody I was dating go get my child from Georgia and drive him all the way back to Chicago, you're out of your mind. While I'm fucking chilling at home in my fucking nightgown with my fucking housekeeper, how about you fucking throw the dad under the bus? Ooh, you don't want to come home? Well, guess what? Dad doesn't want you either. Don't be his friend. Be his mother. Tough love, people. Or just send a fucking car to pick him up and put him on a plane. Like, I don't understand these movies where kids are like, I'm not going to do that. Like, fuck you, dude. You're my kid. You're going to do what I tell you to do. I And see, I don't know. Maybe I live in like a, a really like big house dream world because like, well, <laughs> dream world because my my kids don't do this. Like they, you know, they might try to say no, but like they they know that saying no is not really an option for them. They do what they're asked because that's what kids are supposed to do. Well, that's the problem here. We got fucking Natalie's worried about losing that check and free housing. So she's never put Doyle's feet to the fire. Step up, be a mom, put down the wine. I'm starting to worry about whether or not, uh, you know, Dutch has made the right choice. Upon arriving in Georgia, <laughs> Dutch finds Doyle to be much like his father, snobbish, selfish, and elitist. He attacks Dutch and shoots him with a BB gun, for which Dutch promises revenge. Dutch ultimately hogties Doyle to a hockey stick and carries him to the car. 
Their trip entails several mishaps, including an impromptu fireworks show, a lit cigar in Dutch's lap, and Dutch throwing Doyle out of the car. Doyle gets even by parking Dutch's car in the middle of the highway, where it is hit and totaled by a truck. They hitch a ride with two call girls who steal their luggage and Dutch's wallet, leaving them stranded. Okay, so we, we've said it a couple times, road trip movie. I'm going to lay out the simple road trip formula for you. It's predictable. We know it. Gene and I, we, we reviewed um, The Sure Thing. You and I sat there and we were predicting beat by beat what was going to happen. So you get characters, they're going to take a trip. They're going to go from point A to point C. And along the way, they're going to stop at B, C, and D. And while they're there, these things are going to happen to them. And the characters are going to hate each other, but they're going to bond on this wacky trip. And while these things happen along the trip, it's going to teach them things they didn't know about themselves. Now, Dutch, it checks every damn single box in this. So it should be like the sure thing where we're kind of like, oh, it's predictable. But because it's a formula, it doesn't mean that it's always bad. This works. And, and it kind of fades into the background. You forget that you're watching this formulaic film, that you know what's going to happen because the characters are, are so likable and relatable. What keeps it fresh is that they cross lines that we haven't seen crossed. And there's just absolute fucking cruelty, right? So even in Dumb and Dumber, where they're kind of mean to each other a little bit, you don't get what Dutch is doing. Dutch is taking shit to another level. I'm all for teaching a kid a lesson, but he fucking leaves him in the snow, like miles away from the motel where he could freeze to death. It's insane. They're just pushing the envelope. I like it. Yeah, for me, it's not so much a formulaic road trip film as much as it is a formulaic John Hughes film. Like this feels like an adultified, I know that's not a real word, but adultified version of that. And that's where the movie kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit starting in this section here because like there's these weird, and I don't think they're intentional callbacks. And I think that's why they bother me. But there's these references, these moments that feel like they're complete copies of other and arguably better John Hughes films. Films, like in Home Alone or like Plane Trains and Automobiles. And I know that some of you are not fans of Home Alone, but I think it's a great movie. And while I do think that Ed O'Neill is great, he's fantastic in this film. Anybody else in that role, though, this movie, I think is going to feel pretty contrived. No, 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 no. If, if mm. Home Alone took the chances that Dutch takes... The, the wet bandits would break into the house. They tied Kevin to a yes. radiator, strip him naked, and then he'd have to get revenge on him. And break his fucking arm. Yeah, that's what they would have done. I'd rather see Home Alone. And the other element that this brings to life, though, is there is a very strong message about class that we have not seen, I don't think, in any other John Hughes movie. There are these working class speeches that Dutch gives about pride, you know, in his mom working the laundry. Pride in his dad being a bricklayer, pride in his own, you know, labor that that he has done before ascending to whatever level he's ascended to and having the income that he has. Dutch gives these speeches, they're a bit preachy. And I think in any other era, I might have dismissed them, right? Like uh, 20 years ago, I'd say, dude, shut the fuck up. We get it. You're a blue collar worker who thinks he's special because he works with his hands, blah, blah, blah. But currently, like this shit hit home. I was like, all right. Cause right now in 2021, I'm like, Viva la Revolucion, like solidarity with the UAW. You know, like the working man right now is roaring and I'm all about it. And this movie just is so relevant right now. Power to the communes. Dutch is not a working man. We, we've established that. He's beyond that point. He is working class rich. He's got the money in his wallet. He's got the business. He's, he's okay. He's going back to his roots. And he's got to do it because this fucking kid, Doyle, this little prick, Ethan Embry, who I also hated in Empire Records, he embodies this role of this spoiled, entitled, dislikable kid. I honestly disliked him. I just liked the character. I just liked the kid, his face. I just wanted to slap him when he kicks the trash can over or he's stomping on the crickets. I wanted to shake him so badly. But at the same time, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Embry's performance, it, there's these subtle nuances that show you that even though he's an asshole, there's something underneath that has damaged him so that as he grows along the movie, it feels real. It feels like it's actually earned the journey that he takes. 
Yeah, if you look at the Dutch movie poster, you got Ed O'Neill on one side and you got Ethan Embry on the other one. And I could have sworn this kid was the fucking kid from Jerry Maguire. He's got the glasses. He looks like a nerdy little shit. And that's how I remembered him. He was a nerdy kid, kind of feeble, just kind of like, uh, you know, incapable of doing anything. And that is not what we get no. with Coyle. I, I'm so glad they went with this angry little shithead. We've seen movies before where like cool, tough guy takes meat kid and meat kid comes out of his shell and becomes cool and like develops some backbone here. He's got plenty of backbone. He's got plenty of attitude. I totally agree with you, Big D. Uh, Ethan Embry later in the movie when he finally bonds with Dutch and he smiles, it's earned. Like the kid's got a great smile. When you see him light up, you're happy that he did. Mm -hmm. Like you're not cynical toward it. You're not questioning it. You're like. Yeah, like this feels good. It actually feels good. I didn't even recognize Ethan Embry for the first like 20 minutes of the film because I'm so used to seeing him as a blonde. I had a, like a, a hot minute where I thought he was really adorable in Empire Records. And in, what the fuck was the name of that movie with the yearbook? Can't Hardly Wait. Can't Hardly Wait. Yes. And he was in that and he was pretty precious. And so he just looks really different. And he's so just like bubbly and bouncy in those films and in this he's like an angsty little shit and i think that that's perfect um that he's an absolute asshole because that's what makes it work like he almost deserves the way that dutch treats him and if it hadn't been that way like dutch would have looked like the asshole and so i think they did play that part really well i hope i grow up uh before ever attempting parenting because watching this movie there's that scene where Doyle takes the car and he puts it on the highway and, and, and it gets hit. Oh. I can tell you this. I actually turned to Sarah and I said, that, I said, if we ever have children, I need you to know this. I need you to be okay with this. I will 100% mouth punch any kid who wrecks my car, endangers a trucker's life, and then looks at me and says, I think this makes us even. Like, I'm not trying to make light of child abuse. This is not a joke. Everybody listening, this is not – a joke. This is real G Lions here, right? There are certain acts in my belief that elevate a child to a man. And this is one of them. <laughs> like you do this shit. You are in a fight now. I'm not going to hospitalize you. I'm not going to use a fucking like belt on you and shit, but you have chosen violence and you're going to catch these fucking hands, kid. No way. Yeah. No. It just changes when they're yours. Like, I can't imagine ever hitting my kids. I think there's something just biological that happens when, like, they're a part of you. And it has to be evolutionary so that you don't eat them or feed them to, like, other beasts. Because kids drive you nuts. Like, they do shit that's, like, awful. But there's no way that you can hurt them. You know, Finn, a couple of months ago, got, like, really angry and he he hit me. And I've never been hit by anyone in my life. And I gave them this whole spiel about how now I have to remember that the one person who's hit me is my child. And wow, he cried for a while. that's worse yeah. than hitting him. Yeah. What the no, fuck is wrong with you? Right. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, you don't have to hurt them like that. But I think the difference here is like Dutch isn't his dad. That's why he doesn't stop you know it doesn't stop him it doesn't stop him from fucking with him and i think it proves my point that this woman is nuts to let him be alone with this dude uh, okay you guys are explaining this like this is the kid in over the top who gets picked up by hawk in the fucking truck no this kid borders on a sociopath you see the way he treats his other like the kids in school he's stomping and killing the crickets he kicks over the trash can he leaves a car and he gives that smirk i think this makes us even he uh, the kid is he's bordering on really fucked up so sometimes i don't condone, i've never hit emma i think if you get a kid to the point where he needs to be hit you're the failure as a parent but this kid needs some strong tough love and I mean, I always think back to Back to the Future when Marty finds out, we got to go back to the future. What's wrong with your kids? Do they become assholes or something? This kid is an asshole. And he makes that borderline blurry on whether or not you should lay your hands on the kid. Ash, you're telling me that if Finn, let's say he gets to 13 years old, right? He takes your car. He drives it out onto the fucking highway and leaves it there for somebody to hit. And then when somebody does hit it, he looks at you and says, I think we're even now. You're not going to slap the shit out of him? No, but I've also never hit anyone in my life. It's a good time to start. Yes, that's a good time to start. No, I would not hit my kid. My mother had a rug beater. 
like a big Swedish wicker rug beater that yes. she would hit things. And you know what it was? She got me with it probably two or three times. After that, just the threat of the rug beater. Vanessa tells a story about her mother taking a switch, making her go out into the yard, pick a branch. And she said, you know what? I got hit twice and I behaved myself the rest of my life. Ash, just some advice here. Not saying hit a kid, but I'm saying <laughs> hit somebody. It feels fucking awesome. Nah, I'm much crueler with my words than I could ever be with my fists. So. I'd say you need to get better with your fists then. Oh, no. Maybe you should get better with your words. I got the best words. Uh, you got the best <laughs> words. So uh, I want to shift from a traumatic you know, experience that a kid might have getting beaten to a positive one. I remember as a kid... You're hitting puberty. You're starting to get interested in sex. You're excited. It's, you know, your curiosity is is starting to peak. So here Dutch tries to bond with Doyle. So he says, hey, I got some nudie cards. And I think this experience is universal. We're, I'm going to learn here right now if it's not. About kids, kind of their first exposure to adult content. I think now with kids today, with cell phones, it is so easy to find naked pictures, porn. They're Googling everything when they're young. But, you know, these playing cards were like, for me, it reminded me, my father used to have Playboy pinup, like the calendars, hidden in the basement, in his workshop. The day that I found them, it became like this hidden shrine of knowledge where I was going to learn something new. Or when Michael poses, I've talked about this before, when we had have sleepovers and we would find his dad's stash of, of VHS porn. Back then, you had to work to find this forbidden material. Sadly, today, kids... It's just the mystery is gone. They learn about it so early. And I think that's why they have such a, a just a, a casual belief about sex. I had the grievous misfortune of discovering porn before I discovered masturbation. And it led me to a condition I can only refer to as the horny shivers. Did you guys ever get the horny shivers? No, is that is that like shooting blanks? I used to shoot blanks. No, 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 no. This is when you look at porn and you get aroused. So you're getting, you got an erection, you don't know what to do. And then you start to get very cold and then you start no. shaking. No. You don't, you don't know what to do. And I'm sure my family must have noticed. So I would go and I'd get in my cousin's Playboy stash. She always had it, you know, by the way, like real clever hiding place for your Playboys between your mattress and your box spring. Yeah. Never find it there. So I'd go and I'd take his Playboy magazines out and I, I look at them. And one day he gets home from work. And I'm like, shit, I put him back and I go out in the living room and act like everything's normal. But I am fucking shivering with my horny. He's looking at me and he knows something's wrong. I feel like I'm going to die because I also like, again, don't know what to do to like let this go. So normally I'd get the horny shivers and then I would just go like go for a walk or something that would make it go away. But I had to just sit still with the horny shivers. I can't believe you guys never got this. You feel, it's like the flu. You feel cold no. and you're shaking and kind of sweating a little bit. How old are you? Eight years old, seven years oh, old. Oh, no. See, that's that's far too young. At like 13, I was starting to whack it, but nothing was coming out. It was like shooting blanks, but. You were not ejaculating at 13? Um, again, maybe the age is fuzzy. Whenever I started, I was not shooting anything, so. I guarantee there was semen coming out of your penis at 13. It was nothing. I was shooting. I, it was, I don't know. It's so long ago. At 13, you were like, what, six foot tall, 180 <laughs> pounds, something like that? Maybe 13's an exaggeration. Maybe it was You younger. were gushing rivers, my friend, no, I guarantee. No. You were like a great white oh squid. God, all of this is so gross. Now, once the cork came out of the bottle, then it was just a gusher. But <laughs> um, I remember seeing a guy naked for the first time, like in porn. And just getting really confused because I didn't feel excited. I just felt really nervous about where I was going to put it. And I think that all the women in the pornos made me feel just really bad about myself because I didn't have boobs yet. So I think boys are really weird because porn for me was like a mm, don't think I want to do that kind of thing. I remember thinking, looking at the Playboys, that the women were so large, <laughs> like not fat, but like they were very big. And now it makes sense yeah. because I was eight. Because you were little. So to me, that was a very big person. And I was like, God, there's so much of her. Yeah, there was so much yeah. of them, too. Yeah, <laughs> I just remember the giant bushes on that 1970s Playboy calendar. Yeah, I'm not old, so they were all bare for the time they got to me. Huge. Because like I had seen like family members naked, and I was like, wow, they must have to not have hair in order to have this job. 
and how right I was. But like, you know, I mean, like, I just was like, really confused by it all. I mean, y'all know me, I'm like, super analytical. And so like, I think I probably approached it from that, like, hmm, so where does the penis go? And how does it all work together? Like, you know, just like really analyzing it and going, I'm not sure I want to ever do this. And then of course, I did like three years later, but it was fine. Did you ever do that, like mirror examination of yourself to kind of like Madonna? Yeah, like, the- are you asking if I've ever looked at my vagina with a mirror? Like when you were a kid where you're like let me explore let me look my whispering eye what does it look like up close (laughs) um every woman's done that every girl's done that i remember the first time i I looked at my gooch in the mirror and it was very upsetting (laughs) i was probably hairy (laughs) i don't know how people do it how they look at gooches or how they like how women just put up with the fact that like just below the penis there is oh disaster happening yeah i mean it's okay i mean the ball sack's worse so you know they're all ugly i think my ball sack's okay happy thanksgiving everyone <laughs> when you look at that turkey <laughs> gobble 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 think of big d's ball think sack that big old ball sack <laughs> doyle calls his father whom he discovers lied about his trip to london and spent the holidays with a girlfriend Wounded by Dutch's accusation that he hates his mother, Doyle begins to regret his callous attitude. Dutch and Doyle sneak a ride on the back of a semi-truck and are assaulted by security guards at a trailer drop yard until Doyle brandishes his BB gun and feigns insanity, which frightens the guards enough to allow their escape. I sometimes kind of like wonder like why we feel so nostalgic for holidays like Thanksgiving, like Christmas. And I wonder if we actually would without movies like this because i don't know if i would feel this excitement about coming home for christmas or at thanksgiving or have the guilt for not going home for christmas or thanksgiving without movies telling me that that's how i'm supposed to feel and that's how the world's supposed to be because i have to be really honest and maybe this is because i am a huge cynic right but like as i get older i feel like every year the holidays just kind of disappoint because they don't match up to these feelings and like i enjoy it i love watching my kids open their gifts. I love, you know, buying the presents and wrapping the presents. I think that's all fun. But like the feeling that's captured in like the greatest holiday films, like I don't feel those feelings while sitting under the Christmas tree. And I've wondered in kind of recent years if I ever felt them or if I'm just remembering what I've seen rather than like what I actually experienced. I am so the opposite. When I yeah. was younger at Christmas, I'd just be like, eh, whatever. Like, are there presents or some shit? I don't know. I don't fucking care about yeah. this. Fucking Christians, blah, blah, blah. Now I go to Zoo Lights. I cry. I'm sitting on the couch and there's like a two foot Christmas tree next to me. I look at the lights. I'm like, they're so pretty. I start crying. Eggnog. I cry. Like yeah. everything about Christmas is like so beautiful to me. And I feel it all like so much. I feel mm-hmm. like we're just on divergent paths here. Yeah. I would think that Gene would be the one with 18 Tupperware containers of decorations. So what are you doing? You're faking it? I think I go through the process I'm supposed to go through because like, I want to have <laughs> those. Trad- You're faking it. I don't think I'm faking it. I want to have those traditions for my kids and I do it for my kids. I don't decorate my house for Christmas for me. I decorate my house for Christmas for my kids because they love it and they feel those like big mega feelings. And like those are the moments of Christmas that I love. But like Christmas is by far the most stressful time of the year. Like I am beyond stressed at Christmas. That's the problem. I could see that because, yeah, my Christmas is like, it's me, it's Sarah, a glass of good whiskey, maybe some mushrooms, and we look at the tree for a while, and that's that's Christmas. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. Mine is like making sure that all the presents are perfect, making sure that everything's done for Santa, the fucking elf on the shelf that I have to move every day. Like, you know, like all that kind of shit is like really, really, really stressful. And then there's my family. And I mean, Christmas is just full of obligations. But that's your fault. You set the bar too high. I've started M out with low no, expectations. I just think that's Christmas as a mom. <laughs> we get one tree. We'll decorate it. We just have and, one tree. Wait, yeah. we have fucking multiple trees. No, but you're fucking doing garland and like the, the, the little silver balls and shit around the house. No, we got one tree. We're good to go. Now, in Ash's defense, she, her Halloween to Christmas decoration ratio is like seven to four. Yep. So it's really a minor holiday in her house compared to Halloween. Very true. 
as all holidays are, except for Mardi Gras. I do decorate pretty well for Mardi Gras. Ash, to your point, though, the 80s and 90s and John Hughes, they were obsessed with showing us this like cozy, like winter stuff, like Midwest comforts. In every movie, it's always Thanksgiving or Christmas or almost Thanksgiving or always Christmas. It's always snowing. And you could really feel that comfort in Dutch of a cozy motel room or a warm car with cushy seats and country music on the radio or breakfast at a diner with a steaming cup of coffee. And I miss the Midwest. I honestly do. I don't mi- miss living in Ohio, but I miss Chicago. I miss Michigan. I miss my friends. And there's this scene where they're in that greasy spoon diner and Dutch says, hot cakes and bacon on a cold day. Very sexy. And I felt that. I miss that feeling because Arizona, it's just fucking, it's the same season all year long. Mm-hmm. And I know this sounds crazy to say, but the movie almost respects the locals, the working folk. Yeah, you got the one guy who's like gnawing on the bone, but the rest of them are like regular people, even at the the motel. Yes, there's people outside drinking, but they're having fun. Nobody's fighting. They're having a good time. Yeah. The truck driver says, hey, if your dad wasn't cool, I'd be sending your ass to jail. That seems kind of, uh, you know, level headed to me. Even all of like the the people they meet, the shelter all along the way seem like grounded, cool, kind of chill people. So I like that the movie didn't have any jokes at their expense. So now, Gene, I've been just gushing over this movie pretty much. I do have an issue. The movie does border on that (laughs) hijinks a couple times. One of the big things it does is we're going to see some physical altercations. Dutch says, I'm going to teach you. We're going to have a fight here. Well, but none of that, you know, brown belt karate BS. I want some all American street fighting. Let's lay it out there. He knocks out Dutch, of course, comically. But then Doyle later takes down two 300 pound security guards. The movie went from being grounded and kind of uh, earnest in its emotions to something like Beverly Hills Ninja. But I want to know, Gene, could you have taken down Doyle with three years of studying to get his high-level brown belt? Because I think there's no 10-year-old kid, 12-year-old kid that I could not just, just manhandle. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, he's studying karate or taekwondo or whatever. Like it's pretty ineffective in a self-defense situation to begin with, right? Like it teaches you some good fundamentals, but whatever. We have a, a a young warriors program at my gym at EVKM in Arizona. I could take any of those kids and wipe the floor with them. It's not even an issue. Uh, Ash could smack those kids around. Like it's it's not a big deal. Ash, not that you're not a powerful woman, but just saying having never hit anybody, you could still smack those kids around. And I, I highly encourage it. <laughs> I wanted to see Doyle and Dutch have a legit fight. I think it would have made the movie better if Doyle actually got his ass kicked by Dutch, yeah. like trying his karate shit and just getting fucking punched in the head because yeah. that's a street fighter and street fighters are terrifying people. No amount of training is going to save you from that size difference in an enclosed space. Uh, I have a friend and a listener of the pod, Rex Travers, and he actually wrote me on Twitter about Bull Durham. Hey, Gene, Krav Maga or no, I will fight you over your remarks concerning Susan Sarandon. And this guy's basically your size, Big D. He's, he's, a, he's another gunner. He's an Arsenal fan, and we hang out at the bar together. Big dude, believe it or not, meaner looking than you because you have a kind face. <laughs> he has a face that looks like a like a Brooklyn brownstone. Like he's he's mean looking, and there's no fucking way I'm winning that fight. I could escape, and I, I believe Doyle could run, but you're not going to stand and fight Dutch, much less two security guards with fucking batons. They'll kick the shit out of you, kid. Okay, so in an enclosed space, how many Doyles could you take? Could you take four of them? Yeah, easy. Take Krav Maga kids, don't take karate. Yeah, and if you're going to kick somebody in the dick, don't sidekick them in the dick. Fucking do a groin kick like a man. Get it in there. I could kick a dude in the dick. It's easy. The legs form a natural funnel that leads everything up to the crotch. Ladies out there, you don't have to kick the dick. Just graze it. That's enough. (laughs) That's Dutch and Doyle. (laughs) Enter a restaurant where they meet a married couple who takes them to a homeless shelter in Hammond, Indiana for the night. At the shelter, Doyle grows fond of a young girl and her family. He finally realizes that he has been neglecting his mother and indeed wants to be with her for the holidays. The next day, the family drives Dutch and Doyle to Natalie's home where Reed is waiting. Doyle reunites with his mother and reveals to Reed that he knows the truth about his trip to London. 
So we see this family that's supposed to be helping Dutch and Doyle out. And what do they do? They drive him to the shelter of which the dude is a board member. Guys, if you're trying to help people out, don't do not do this shit. Like I'm a big fan of helping people out by just giving them what they're asking for. That is the easiest way to help somebody. If someone needs a ride, you don't take them to the shelter. You give them a ride. If someone needs money, don't give them a snack bag. Give them money. I fully expected that couple dining at the restaurant to give Dutch and Doyle like a hundred bucks, say, you know, happy Thanksgiving and send them on their way, get a bus, you know, get to where you need to get. Instead, they take them to a center for displaced families. And I like that the movie made it seem unappealing. You get that churchy singing coming from inside and fuck, I wouldn't want to go in there. There's always an angle from people trying to help you. And I think it's what pisses me off the most about like charities, right? They always want to preach something to you or make you do something, some sort of a group activity or, you know, it's just, it's always the wrong people trying to help out in the right way. So my ask of you all this, these holidays is just give the people what they fucking want. You don't necessarily have to let them in your car, but you know, give them cab fare. That's fine. Yeah, but this is so perfect because this is exactly what people like this are like. They offer to help because it makes them feel good. And if this were today, they would have fucking selfied in front of the shelter and been like, hashtag blessed. You know, I mean, like, that's what would happen. And so I think it was. I think it was perfect. And I thought it was really funny. I mean, when they walk up there and they've got that music in the background, I busted out laughing because I know the people that work in these places and I know the people that would drive them and drop them off. And they're self-righteous motherfuckers. Okay. So Dutch, I appreciate you offering the guy, you know, the, the, that, that family, Hey, call the office to see if I can get you a job. How about you invite this fucking family into this giant house for Thanksgiving dinner? You want them to spend it in a car out in the cold? You got a giant house. Why don't you invite them in for dinner? Would have been the nice thing to do. This journey feels really earned. And I feel like I say that a lot on this pod, like something is either earned or it's not. But the transition that Doyle makes is earned here because he has this total change. But it isn't a change where like all of a sudden he's this amazing person. You know, in a lesser movie, he would have been like serving food at the shelter. He almost got dropped off at at the end because Mm -hmm. he's become such a good boy. But instead in this one, you know, he just realizes he's been a dick. He's been a dick to his mom and he decides to be nice. Nice. And I'm really glad that this one, as formulaic as it is in parts, did not go down that route. And I think also one of the the factors that causes the change is within him. So he's come to a realization that, you know what? Holy shit, I'm causing my mother pain. Maybe she didn't cause the, the divorce. My dad doesn't love me. And he started to internally change. And I thought that was something that we, it's normally some external factor. So this was, it was a nice change. It goes back to like the Sopranos season one, right? Where Tony's like yeah. in his mother's grasp because the last thing he can accept is that his mother or anybody would think that he hates his mom because he feels like mm-hmm. that would make him ungrateful, right? Or that would make him a bad person. So there's some powerful stuff going on in this movie for, for a road trip comedy. When Doyle decides to stay with his mother instead of Reed for Thanksgiving, Reed evicts Natalie from the house. Dutch follows Reed outside and hits Reed in the forehead with his pinky ring. He then demands that Reed show more respect to Natalie and become a better father to Doyle, to which a dazed Reed agrees. As Natalie, Dutch, and Doyle sit down to begin their Thanksgiving feast, Dutch asks Doyle to retrieve Dutch's coat as it contains a very special gift for Natalie. And as Doyle walks away, Dutch pulls the BB gun Doyle originally shot him with and finally gets his revenge. So we talked about some of the heart that this movie shows. It really snuck in a clever lesson that was revealed so organically and beautifully in the end. Doyle reunites with his mother, and we see that like that struggle of reaching his destination makes the destination all the more precious. And this is a real thing. I've been stranded a few times while traveling, most recently when American Airlines canceled flights and told me I couldn't get home for three days. You have to fend for yourself. You have to get creative. You, you don't have all the comforts that you're used to. There's no lodging. There's no you know transportation. You got to figure all that out. After that ordeal, I, I'd never been happier to finally get on a plane and get home. When I got on that flight, I cheered for my seat. I was sitting in the center seat. I was so excited about my snacks. I was so excited about my soda, <laughs> taking off, about landing, about the people sitting next to me. You know. And then when we finally got home, it was like a fucking $60 Uber ride. I didn't care got home and it's just, you know, tiny home, dogs, 
doesn't matter, man. It's just your home. You made it. And the travel is what made it special. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I mean, traveling is a fucking nightmare when you can't get home the way that you want to. Even if you're like within a couple hundred miles of your hometown, you feel like you're in a whole nother world. But I do have to say that I felt like this film got super formulaic in the end because I know it's a road trip film, but I think it had enough originality up to this point in parts to avoid it from being cliche. But I don't know, it's kind of let down by the ending. I thought it got kind of boring toward the end. I thought it got predictable. And I think the worst part about it was I think Dutch in some parts becomes a bit of a punchline where I didn't want him to be. Like he had avoided that. Like you said at the beginning, you were afraid he was going to be like, I can't King Ralph type guy. And that's kind of what in some parts they turned him into. And it was almost like they ran out of ideas because it sucked. And I think that Ed O'Neill, again, phenomenal. But I think toward the end, it fell apart a little bit. The low point of the movie, without a doubt, is when Dutch turns around to fight Doyle. He kicks his leg up in the air inexplicably, <laughs> yes. slips and falls on his ass and his shoe mm-hmm. hits him in the head and it makes like a boom noise. And you're like, what the fuck was that all about? Yeah. I'm glad, though, that at the end, they kind of pulled it back there. Like he still punches Reed in the end with his pinky ring, mm-hmm. kind of gets some of his like machismo back. And then he shoots Doyle with a BB gun like he makes good. He's still Dutch. Like they haven't broken him. And I, but I do agree, Ash, that for about, I don't know, a quarter to a third of the movie, we had lost Dutch as a character and he just became a, the butt of a joke. And I wasn't enjoying that part. Mm-hmm. I'm going to rewrite that final scene. I think, yes, maybe you hit him, but then you also throw the line back at him. Say, hey, this is a family matter. Do you mind just kind of leaving us alone? Kind of make him realize the father. Hey, just go. Was this a Schwarzenegger movie? What do you mean? I think it would have hurt his feelings. This is a family matter. No, because that's what he says to Dutch <laughs> in the beginning. I know that's what he says to Dutch. And he says it at the end, too. But that's a Schwarzenegger movie you're describing, sir. No, but at least he shoots him in the ass. I'm glad he didn't like, hey, oh, I was just joking. He shoots him in the dick. Really? Yeah. God bless him. <laughs> Well, now's the time when we give our wipe score. Our wipe score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your respective butts. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is falling asleep in the heaving breasts of a Midwestern call girl. And Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It is eating things fish deposit in riverbeds. I'll go first. I think Dutch took, as you said, Big D, a formulaic road trip movie, and it added some Ed O'Neill spiciness to punch it up. And that's a formula that works for me. The cast is great, especially Ethan Embry. And I was entertained the whole time. My only gripe is exactly what Ash said. Dutch, by the end of the movie, becomes sort of the joke I'd worried he'd be at the beginning. I didn't like him slipping on his ass, getting his ass beat by a child, and just sort of kind of falling apart as a human being. This movie could have had all the same impact, all the same beats as far as heart goes, while making him stand out from all the other loser dads of cinema. Like how great would it be if the secret between Dutch and Doyle, the thing they never talk about around Natalie is that they had a full on fist fight on the roid and Doyle got his ass kicked. Mom doesn't have to know it makes for a better movie. So for me, it's a good movie. It's a movie I will love forever at one and a half wipes. Yeah, I think it's a really cute movie. I I do think it suffers some, and I know that I just said that I'm not a huge fan of Thanksgiving or Christmas, but I think it's really suffers from being a Thanksgiving movie and not a Christmas movie because despite all of the things, Christmas the movies they have a magic to them there's the lights there's the colors there's the extra snow it just makes them feel a bit more special so while i have to say i didn't get like a lot of holiday vibes in this i think it's a really cute coming of age film i think ethan embry is fantastic in it and i think it also shows why ed o'neill is just like the absolute best he's amazing by far not my favorite John Hughes film, but this is good. It's way better than average. And so I'm going to go a little bit worse than Eugene and just say two wipes. Why do people think Thanksgiving movies are like uplifting holiday movies? They're all like depressing. Planes, trains, and automobiles. This, it's about the dysfunction of family, not the happiness of them getting together. But this movie, I thought it was so unexpected. I was expecting the wacky hijinks, the more of the slipping on the ice and shoe hitting you in the face. And other than that, the ninja fight with the security guards, 
or that stupid fireworks scene that went on way, way too long, I was pleasantly surprised. I was emotionally connected. I went from hating this kid and wanting to shake him to the end, feeling like I wanted to hug him. So for that, I think it's above average. It's not perfect. It's a 1.5 wipe. Uh, and I will definitely watch this again, maybe even during this Thanksgiving. Big D, you're breaking my heart here. I watched that fireworks scene and I was like, is that what being a dad is? I could do that. <laughs> I can set off fireworks and, and put on a little circus show. It'd work out great. That's not that's not being a dad? Yeah, it was a little bit no. too long. Fuck. A little bit too long. All right. Well, one and a half wipes from me, one and a half wipes from Big D, and two wipes from Ash gives us an average wipe score of 1.6 repeating wipes for Dutch. Okay. So this was not planned. But the wife score kind of kind of goes where it should uh, with a wife score of one point six, six repeating that now ties this in the 89 spot with planes, trains and automobiles, huh. gremlins, war games, the natural, the rock and back to the future part three. Yeah. Okay. It's perfect. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's right in that range. Well, thanks, Adam, for picking one of three Thanksgiving movies that exist out there in the world. Big D, I know we have a very special voicemail from across the pond this week, and let's get it in uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, so, Gene, I always try to include any anti-Big D emails or voicemails we get. Uh, so this week's anti-Big D voicemail comes from Mike in London, and it is about our Bull Durham review. Hi, guys. It's Mike from London here. I was just listening to the, the Bull Dur- Durham review, uh, a movie I, I have not seen. And apart from visiting the Tampa Bay Rays once back in 2015, uh, I have very little interest in baseball. But uh, anyway, during the course of the pod, I heard Big D throw some shade at the English Premier League, you know, when he was talking about the uh, about lower league baseball and that structure. So yeah, I, I know Gene and Ash love it when listeners give Big D shit. So here goes. Big D, the English football pyramid is superior to just about any other sport I can think of. You know, you Google English football pyramid and, and then you come back to me. You know, we have the FA Cup where a team from the eighth tier of the pyramid can end up playing against Manchester United at Old Trafford. You know, or maybe they'll get lucky and draw a lesser team like Arsenal. Oh, shots fired. That, that gate and TV revenue can provide a team with financial security for years to come. So, you know, compare that to the World Series of Baseball. How many how many countries are in the World Series? Hmm? <laughs> anyway, you did redeem yourself a little bit when uh, expressing an interest in cricket, a far superior sport to baseball. For example, compare the fielding position names. In baseball, you have left field, right field, center field. You know, a very, very literal bunch. Cricket, leg gully, fly slip, silly point, because you have to be silly to stand there. Anyway, if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of cricket rules, how about giving the, the Duckworth-Lewis method of Google used for calculating the, uh, the score in rain-affected games? That will blow your mind. Anyway, love you, bye. Okay, so I need to go back and listen to what I was saying because I was not throwing shade at the Premier League. I actually respect it. I was talking about the just just how widespread it was. So the Premier League is just the upper echelon, right? So you've got right. you've got leagues that go down below that in English football. There's I think there's seventy altogether. It, whereas in the U.S., I think it's like 120 or like that. But the U.S. is a much larger country as far as like, yeah. you know, square mileage goes. What they have that we do not have and no as long as far as I know, no American sports have is is promotion relegation. Oh, love it. And if there was promotion relegation in baseball, that would be fucking amazing. There definitely, definitely should be that in every sport. And even even American soccer does have promotion relegation, which drives me up the wall. I'm not a dumb American who's not knowledgeable. I misspoke. I was talking about the entire structure of it. I mean, I recently, you know, I love my documentaries. I watched one about May 87, Turkey United, when defender Jim McNichols was bitten on the thigh by that police dog in the final game against Crew Alexandra. And that extension gave Torquay the chance to get that point to avoid relegation. So I do know a little bit about it, and I actually respect the structure and the love that you guys have for the game. I'd also like to point out that my beloved Arsenal is, and I'm probably jinxing the hair, but fifth in the table and only six points behind Chelsea. So... It's fucking anybody's, it's anybody's league right now. I love you, Mike. 
Well, thanks, Mike, for your voicemail. If you'd like to call in and leave us a voicemail, you can call us at 914-719-SHAT. Or if you're abroad and don't want to call long distance, you can always just email us at hosts at shatthemovies.com. So thanks for joining us for this uh, special Thanksgiving episode. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Uh, So Gene, the celebrations continue. Next week's review is a birthday present from one of our great supporters, Jen D., As America's stock of athletic young men is depleted during World War II, a professional all-female baseball league springs up in the Midwest, funded by publicity-hungry candy maker Walter Harvey. Competitive sisters Dottie and Kit spar with each other, scout Ernie and a grumpy has-been coach Jimmy Dundee on the way to fame. Madonna and Rosie O'Donnell co-star as sisters and teammates. Commissioned by Jen D. Came out in 92, directed by Penny Marshall. And a happy 16th birthday to Jen D's daughter. Well, thanks, Jen, for your commission. Thanks, Adam, for your commission. Thank you to all the commissioners that make Shat the Movies possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link buying our merch or commissioning your own movie find all that information by visiting our website shatthemovies.com also check out our sister podcast shot on tv we review tv series such as lovecraft country westworld true detective taboo american gods game of thrones and watchmen find all that information on our website shot on tv.com wherever we find podcasts can be found including itunes google play stitcher and youtube be sure to subscribe and if you stop by itunes please leave a five-star review that helps the podcast grow also if you have not subscribed to the podcast do it and check often because December is going to be a whirlwind. We've got special episodes. We've got double releases. we got holiday releases. So as you may have noticed, Dutch is a special release. And then we're going to have special dates for uh, other things like Jen's daughter's birthday. So check your podcast feed early and often. And also make sure that you didn't miss any episodes as well. You know what? Just go ahead and set your podcast feed to capture and download all Shat the Movies episodes because that's the way you can make sure you don't miss any. Mm-hmm. Thanks. On behalf of my co host Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. I'd like to lead you all in a little prayer. Dear Lord, may our feet be swift, may our bats be mighty, and may our balls be plentiful. And Lord, I just like to thank you for that waitress in South Bend. You know who she is. She kept calling your name. This summer, Tom Hanks is managing the impossible. The Rockford Peaches. Oh, Peaches! Who says girls can't play baseball? Who says women can't throw? Slide! Slide! Thank you! Sounded good. So let's all root for the girls team. Let's give the poor coach a break. You're still missing the cutoff man. Now that's something that I would like you to work on before next season. Cause it's flash, flash. Columbia Pictures would like to take you out to the ball game for an all-star comedy. They'll pay you $75 a week. We only make 30 at the dairy. Well then, this would be more, wouldn't it? The manager, Tom Hanks. Are you crying? <laughs> There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. The catcher, Gina Davis. What do you say we slip in the back seat and you make a man out of me? What do you say I smack you around for a while? Can't we do both? The pitcher, Lori Petty. I made it! I'm a peach! A Rockford peach! The scout, John Lovitz. Are you coming? See how it works is. The train moves, not the station. And batting cleanup, Madonna. What if my uniform bursts open and oops, my bosoms come flying out? You think there were men in this country who ain't seen your bosoms? A league of their own. All right. God knows we have a game. It's not like any of this helps, believe me. Directed by Penny Marshall.